This video is sponsored by EcoFlow. Climate change is making extreme weather conditions worse, making famously dry regions even drier, and areas that are usually receiving tons of rain more prone to flooding. This costs us hundreds of lives and millions of dollars in damages every year. But what if we could turn this negative aspect of climate change into something positive by just pumping away water from regions prone to flooding to regions prone to drought before a flood comes? Well, good news. That's exactly what we're talking about today. I'm Ricky, and this is Tuba Da Vinci. I've often thought about desalination as the ideal solution to alleviate the need for fresh water supplies near the coastline, and I made a video called Why Aren't Desalination Plants Everywhere, which recently started to surge. But then I thought, climate change hasn't only brought drought to places like Southern California where I live, it has also worsened storms leading to massive floods that send millions of gallons of fresh water to waste in the ocean. Well, not to waste, but we can't drink it. We have flood management infrastructure in place like dams and reservoirs designed to hold as much of the excess water that's coming in. But when these systems are already at full capacity and a massive storm comes by, there's no other choice but to open up dam doors and let the water out, flooding the lowland downstream and spilling all the fresh water into the ocean. This got me thinking, instead of spending hundreds of millions on desalination plants, doesn't it make more sense to just pump water out of those full reservoirs to regions prone to drought before the storm hits? That way, when the storms do come, there will be enough capacity in reservoirs, avoiding flooding and making use of all that fresh water. The answer to this question is more complex than it might seem at first glance, and there are several things to consider. Let's start with where all the water is. Water is the lifeblood of every town, city, farm, and ecosystem on Earth. However, even though 71% of the Earth's surface is covered in fresh water, fresh drinking water is very scarce. In fact, we only have access to about 0.5% of the Earth's total water. If we rolled up all the fresh water in all the rivers and lakes into a single sphere, like a gigantic water droplet, it would only be about 35 miles wide. It feels strange to think that you could drive by all the Earth's drinkable surface water in only a half an hour doing 70 miles an hour, and it really puts things into perspective. Besides being scarce, fresh drinking water is also very unevenly distributed around the world, and in some parts it's very hard to come by. Luckily for us, we've known how to move water around for hundreds of years. Take California, for example, the most hydrologically altered landmass on the planet, and an increasingly water-thirsty state that is running out of water. California currently houses nearly 40 million residents, which is almost 12% of the entire U.S. population. Of those 40 million residents, about 23.8 million live in the driest part of the state in Southern California, where most of the water demand is, while most of the water comes from the northern third of the state. To make this work, California has multiple aqueducts that bring water from the Colorado River and Northern California to the south. But why is California running out of water? Before we get into that, let me tell you about our sponsor this week. You guys know I love EcoFlow. I have 14 kilowatt hours of home storage with my EcoFlow Delta Pros and the smart home panel, but sometimes I need a smaller, more portable solution, which is exactly why I love the EcoFlow Delta 2. This little guy might be small, light, and compact, but it packs a serious punch. It has one kilowatt hour of capacity, two if you add the extra battery, six AC outlets, 1800 watts output, and USB ports up front. That's enough to power almost anything, from hair dryers, microwaves, air fryers, or refrigerators. Plus, with 1100 watts charging, you can charge it from zero to 80% in just 50 minutes, and it even has 500 watts of solar input. With long-lasting lithium iron phosphate batteries, smart app controls, and that legendary EcoFlow build quality and reliability, this is the battery that comes in handy for just about anything. The EcoFlow Delta 2 is not just a battery. It's an essential home appliance, and it's great for outdoor and travel use too. Head over to a link in the description and use our special promo code for an extra 5% discount. Huge thanks to EcoFlow and you for supporting the show. There are three main reasons. Number one, most of the precipitation in California throughout the year falls as snow in the northern Sierra Nevada mountains. Because of climate change, we're getting far less snow during the winter each year. The snowpack acts as a natural reservoir that feeds all the streams, rivers, and lakes as temperatures rise and the snow melts. Less snowpack means less available water during the warmer months of the year. Number two, Lake Mead, which supplies one quarter of California's water and is a lifeline for Southern California, is drying up. The lake that provides up to 4.4 million acre feet of water each year to this day alone is at its lowest historical water level since 1937. And since we're drawing more water from it than the Colorado River can put back in, levels are still falling. Number three, only 40% of California's water goes to domestic and industrial use, while the other 60% goes to farming. And farming is big in California. 
The state is the breadbasket of the country, single-handedly producing 13.5% of the total U.S. agricultural production, including one-third of all America's vegetables and two-thirds of all the fruits and nuts. California also produces 80% of the world's almonds, all of it in a 5.68 million acre stretch of farmland in the fertile Central Valley region that is only a little bigger than the state of New Jersey and a tad smaller than New Hampshire. Very fertile land, yes, but also very dry. As the American population increases, so does the demand for food from California's farms and therefore the demand for water. Severe droughts like the one we're going through have devastating consequences. According to a study by UC Merced in 2021, the ongoing drought costs losses of upwards of $1.1 billion in the agricultural industry alone, along with 14,634 lost jobs across all industries. Add to that the indirect material and human losses caused by wildfires and related disasters and we can easily see just how bad things can get and they'll continue to get worse. So what can we do about droughts? The city of Las Vegas can point us in the right direction. Through smart policies, water conservation, recycling, and reuse strategies, the city has been able to reduce its water consumption by 26%, even though its population has increased over 750,000 residents in the past 20 years. Success stories like these are why I'm working on all sorts of home tech to better utilize and eventually create water on my Net Zero Home series. Feel free to check out some of those videos, links in the description. However, while we could cut down consumption in the big urban hubs, we can't cut down food production in California. There's just too much at stake. So there must be another way to solve this issue without looking for more sources of water. This is where the next key part of the video comes in. Floods. Apart from all the human and material losses, floods spill millions of gallons of fresh drinking water into the ocean, water we could use to alleviate droughts elsewhere. You see, the way things are set up now in most places like California is through flood control systems made up of a series of canals, alluviums, dikes, dams, and reservoirs, or holding tanks to store or divert extra water when it rains heavily. But what if we did things differently? What if instead of thinking of ways to improve flood control by building more dams, which are crazy expensive, we took a more proactive approach and switched to flood risk management? Here's how that would look. Suppose you know that a severe storm is about to hit, and you realize that all of your flood control reservoirs and extra holding tanks are nearly full. So you start pumping water out of those reservoirs in a controlled way in preparation for the extra rainfall. But you don't simply release it downstream, but pump it to a neighboring state or wherever there is a water shortage. This will help you kill two birds with the same stone. The empty reservoir or reservoirs will be able to accommodate the extra water when the storm hits without opening the floodgates, thereby avoiding the flood itself and avoiding losing all that precious water. This could prove to be a new form of water management and work similarly to energy microgrids by balancing water supply and demand to make the most use of the precious resource when it falls naturally as rain. Now, in order for this to work, there are two major obstacles we need to address. The first is knowing in advance when there's going to be heavy rainfall and where, so we can mitigate the risk by pumping water out. We'll also need to know if there's enough capacity to store all the water we need to pump out at the desired destination. This is by no means a simple problem. Still, it's one that NVIDIA, the world's leading GPU manufacturer and a force to be reckoned with in artificial intelligence computing, is ready to tackle. I talked with Karthik Kashinath from NVIDIA, where they're working on an amazing machine learning and AI project called Earth2, a digital twin of the Earth designed to study the Earth's climate. One of the first accomplishments of NVIDIA's Earth2 initiative is that we've built this high-resolution data-driven weather forecasting system called ForecastNet. And it is about 50,000 times faster than your traditional numerical weather forecasts. The second is it's about as accurate as numerical weather forecasting systems, which means that we can predict things like hurricanes and atmospheric rivers and storms and tornadoes and other uh, extreme weather events at, at, at a much larger scale uh, with much higher fidelity and about 50,000 times faster. At the crux of that issue is being able to predict well in advance, not just at short time scales, you know, a few days ahead, but potentially maybe a few weeks or even seasons ahead. And being able to also foresee that this is going to happen in a certain location at a certain time. And so what NVIDIA is trying to do here is to develop the best AI technologies and combine it with the best available data sources. So for example, if you're trying to regulate the amount of water from a dam and try to pump that over to another state, you need to know well in advance how much rainfall is expected in which part of the state. And 
what the conditions are going to be to be able to pump it over to another state and what's the condition in that state are they ready to receive this water that they have the storage facilities and so on and that requires a digital twin so through earth 2 and the omniverse platform nvidia is able to tackle the uncertainty behind the weather by making extremely fast predictions with superb resolution good accuracy and stretching further into the future than ever before by coupling these predictions with digital twins of our hypothetical hydro microgrids to optimize water distribution and flood risk management we can practically assure the system's success provided we have the necessary infrastructure in place to move water around as needed. This brings us to the second major obstacle, the cost of the infrastructure's construction and operation. This is the single biggest hurdle, and it's not an easy fix. In fact, Australians tried to do something similar to this at the beginning of the 20th century, but the project never took off, primarily because of cost. The project was called the Bradfield Scheme. Sounds really ominous, but... It was aimed to take floodwaters from the coastal regions of Australia and pump them inland, where it would allegedly transform the arid terrain into a sort of green oasis with milder, cooler weather through a sort of rainforest effect. The project was turned down after several independent assessments concluded that the costs were prohibitive and that the plan just wouldn't work. But what if we already have the bulk of the infrastructure in place, but we just didn't know it yet? Well, it turns out we do. As we move away from fossil fuels, we could repurpose oil and gas pipelines when we don't need them anymore to use for pumping water instead. This alone could make such a project not only feasible, but relatively cheap. Now, the first thing that pops into most people's heads when thinking about reusing oil pipelines for pumping water is water pollution. Oil is full of carcinogenic aromatic compounds that are hazardous to both our health and the environment. This means we'd need to clean them pretty well in order to be able to reuse them as aqueducts. So is this even possible? Can we clean oil pipelines well enough to repurpose them for pumping clean, fresh drinking water? Or is it just another pipe dream? Get it? Pipe dream. The short answer is yes. And in fact, it's already been done before. According to Pipeline Equities, a company that engages in pipeline mergers and acquisitions, as well as pipeline salvaging, a 30 mile section of an oil pipe was recovered and shipped to Vietnam to be used as a water transportation pipeline near what we now know as Ho Chi Minh City, where it would likely serve for an additional 40 years after being repurposed. Okay, okay, I know what you're thinking. Cleaning 30 miles of pipe is one thing, that's peanuts. But what about cleaning over 2000 miles of pipe free of oil? It turns out that engineers already thought of that. They use special tools dubbed pipeline inspection gadgets or PIGs, PIGs, to clean and inspect pipelines all the time. And we could adapt them to wipe pipes clean of oil. If this doesn't convince you though, there are also plenty of natural gas pipelines that have never come into contact with crude oil and that would therefore require almost little to no cleaning. The point is we have options and plenty of them without having to build the infrastructure from scratch. There are around 3 million miles of oil and natural gas pipelines across the nation, and they already connect America's most strategic cities. By reusing pipelines that are already there, we eliminate the need to salvage and remove those pipelines when they're decommissioned. And we eliminate the need to build new aqueducts, avoiding, among other things, further damage to ecosystems, landscapes, and more. Now, I can almost hear you asking, how much would it cost to run this thing? That would be very hard to assess since the cost of pumping water around depends on topography and many other factors. If we need to pump water up a hill, we need bigger pumps that represent a higher upfront cost and consume more energy, making the operation more expensive. But we can at least get a rough idea of how much energy consumption would be needed if we look at Southern California. Here, more than 50% of the water comes either from Northern California, 400 miles away, or Lake Mead. Pumping water these long distances requires approximately 3,000 kilowatt hours per acre foot of water pumped. That's the amount of energy required to charge a Tesla Model 3 standard range roughly 60 times, or the amount of energy an average Californian household uses in about five months, and is enough water for the same household for six to 12 months. Energy costs aside, the savings and damages from preventing floods and droughts year after year could be enough to offset the entire building and operation of the system. Worldwide flood damage in 2021 produced combined economic losses of $82 billion, 41 billion of which were in Europe. And we already saw how much last year's drought cost California's economy, about 1.1 billion. Okay, so there's only one thing left for us to analyze regarding our pipeline repurposing ambition. 
how much water could we actually pump through the currently available pipelines, assuming we were able to convert them entirely to aqueducts. We'll take the notorious Keystone Pipeline, famous for pumping one of the world's dirtiest fuels, tar sand, from Alberta, Canada to Texas's Gulf Coast. The 2,687 mile long, 36 inch wide stretch of pipe can pump almost 600,000 barrels of tar sand per day at about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. At this temperature, the tar sand's main component, bitumen's viscosity, will be close to 1,100 centiposes, which is over 1,000 times higher than water's. Therefore, if we replace tar sand with water, we should be able to get flow rates of about 1,000 times higher than tar sand at the same operating pressure. So, those 600,000 barrels per day of tar turns into 600 million barrels of water per day, or around 77,336 acre feet per day. This means we'd be able to pump enough water in a day from Alberta to Texas to cover the annual water demand of up to 30 million homes, single-handedly covering all of Southern California's water demand. Will we have to pump that much water out? I don't know. That depends on how much rain we get. But what's important is that we can if we ever needed to. So there you have it, predicting floods with NVIDIA's Earth2 platform and pumping water from areas prone to floods to, in preparation for heavy rainfall to areas of drought while repurposing natural gas and oil pipelines could be amazing, economically feasible, and a smart way to better use our already scarce resource. It could also avoid devastation caused by floods and alleviate the effects of drought in dry but fertile lands like the Central Valley of California. Now keep in mind, we're not removing water from areas that have flood potentials. We're moving water in preparation, which would then be refilled again. So there's a net gain in water. Also, there's the rainforest effect. Have you ever wondered which came first, the rain or the rainforest? Well, rainforests have so much foliage and the trees put out so much water into the air that they cause local areas and storms and rainfall. It's an entire ecosystem. That's kind of what terraforming is all about. So if we started moving water that would be dumped into the oceans from the East Coast or other places that got a lot more rainfall and move them into areas that are more dry and arid, we'd have net new trees and foliage and vegetation. And all of that would lower the ground temperatures, reduce the level of evaporation from the ground from the blistering sun, and eventually create a little bit of a rainforest effect. So there would be a net positive effect. And that's really why this would be such a game changer. And that is a look at what we could potentially do with this sort of an approach. But it would take an entire federal government initiative. States would have to agree to it. We'd have to have a level of agreement and participation that we normally don't see in politics, but I think it's possible and it could be amazing. But what do you think? Do you think this is just a pie in the sky dream or is this kind of the future, a microgrid where water is treated like electricity that could be pumped and used and sold and bought? It could be an entire economy. Let us know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ricky Tuba Da Vinci, but you're not done. If you're curious about desalination, another approach to this, check out this video next.